One of these days I'm gonna leave One of these days I'm going home I'm gonna take my final journey I'm gonna rest neath heaven's blue dome Stepping on the clouds, we'll see Jesus rise to meet him in the air. Stepping on the clouds, he will greet us. Oh, the joy together we'll share. I'm gonna leave this world behind me, where the devil cannot find me. I'm going higher, 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 higher. Stepping on the clouds. Going past the moon, past the moon, the stars and planets. Stars and planets. I'm, gonna I'm gonna walk on the Milky Wide Way. Milky Wide Way. Milky Wide Way. Milky Wide Way. When old Gabriel, when old Gabriel gives, a signal, gives a signal, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave for heaven to stay. For heaven to stay. Stepping on the clouds, we'll see Jesus rise to meet him in the air. Stepping on the clouds, he will greet us. All the joy together we'll share. I'm gonna leave this world behind me where the devil cannot find me. I'm going higher, 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 higher. Stepping on the clouds, stepping on the clouds, we'll see Jesus rise to meet him in the air. Stepping on the clouds, he will greet us. All the joy together we'll share. I'm gonna leave this world behind me where the devil cannot find me. I'm going higher, 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 higher. Stepping on the clouds. We continue our studies in the life of Elijah as we consider in this lesson the faith of both Elijah and the widow to whom he was sent. Let's read from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, uh, verses 8 through the end of the chapter, verse 24. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he saw, or he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, 
Oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is, is in your mouth is the truth. Quite a story here. First, we find Elijah fed by ravens up by the brook Cherith. Now he is sent to a widow in Zarephath and uh, there he will be taken care of for a time. This passage begins by saying that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. How was it that the word of the Lord came to him? Was it in a vision? Was it in a dream? Was it an audible voice? In this case, we aren't told. Sometimes the scripture tells us they had a vision or there was a dream uh, in some way that God communicated with the individuals. But this time we're not told how, we're just said, told that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. This might prompt us to ask this question of ourselves though, how does the word of God come to us today? I've never heard an audible voice of the Lord. I've never had really a vision or a dream that I considered coming from the Lord. But I have the Word of God, I have the Bible that has been given to us by inspiration. And from a very early age, my parents instructed me in the Word of God. Over the years, I've heard various preachers, and some have had a great impact uh, on my life. And then there have been elders and other friends and neighbors and those other Christians in the church that through the years have been an encouragement to me and have even given good advice to me in various situations in life. You know, over in the book of Hebrews, the first chapter and the first uh, couple of verses, we, we read that God, who at sundry times and in various manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, through whom also he created the worlds. So God is speaking to us in these last days through his son. And we may remember that in his personal ministry, Jesus told the disciples that whoever received him received the father who had sent him. And whoever received the disciples, the apostles that Christ sent out to proclaim the truth, that they also receive Jesus. And so it has come to us, this word of God through inspiration. The apostle Peter tells us that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so we believe in the inspiration of God's word. And God speaks to us today through his word and through various individuals who are faithful to God and who know the word of God and who are an influence and an encouragement to us in our lives. Zarephath is a little town, a coastal town, between Tyre and Sidon. In fact, it's a little closer to Sidon than it is to Tyre, but it's on that plain between Tyre and Sidon. And uh, Sidon was actually the hometown of uh, Jezebel, Ahab's wife. And so it's kind of interesting that God sent uh, Elijah the prophet so close to Jezebel's father's uh, home up there. And I suppose it's kind of like hiding in clear sight. Uh, maybe this would be the last place they might think that Elijah would be. But this is where God sends him. You know, how did Elijah know this woman was the one that God had commanded to take care of him. I suppose she was the, the first one that he saw when he came into the gate or he came to the gate of the city. And I suppose he was just trusting that the Lord was going to direct him and guide him uh, to this one that he had been sent 
so that she could care for him. And of course it is, I think, made more uh, clear in Elijah's mind when she responds to him, when he asks her to bring him a drink of water first, and then he adds to that and bring me also, you know, a morsel of bread. And then she says, as the Lord your God lives. And uh, so this indicates that she was also a worshiper of Jehovah, the true God. And uh, so this was further proof and indication to Elijah that this was the woman. And just as this woman had said, as the Lord your God lives, and she told him, you know, she was just out gathering sticks to make a final meal for she and her son, and then they would just die. There was no more flour. There was no more oil in the jar. This was it. This was going to be the last meal. So in this episode in the life of Elijah, we have three, these people involved. We have Elijah and the widow, her son, and the household. There were probably servants in that household. And we're told by the scriptures that the household ate for many days on the flour and the oil that the woman had at the time that Elijah appeared. It's interesting, and I also think it's instructive to us to notice a couple of things that Elijah said to the widow when she responded in this way. He first said, fear not, do not be afraid. Perhaps this woman was anxious. She didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. This was the end of the flour and the end of the oil as far as she could see uh, in her physical circumstances. And so Elijah first says, don't be afraid. Don't fear. You know, trust in God and his providence. Uh, he's working and he will work to preserve you. And then the other thing that he said you know, she was going to prepare a meal for herself and her son. But Elijah said, bring me some bread first. You make some for me first, and then you make some bread for you and your son. Another test of the woman's faith. <laughs> this prophet says, you honor God and his prophet first with what you have. You don't have much. I know you don't. It's about the end of the flower and the end of the oil as far as you can see it. But you just honor God with the little that he has provided for you and then see what God can and will do. You know, throughout the Bible, we find that God always wanted the first from us and he wants the best. He wants the first fruits and he wants the best. I want to read from the book of Leviticus some of the law that was given uh, in regard to the sacrifices that Israel gave and then also the fruit of their ground. In Leviticus, the uh, 22nd chapter, beginning at verse uh, 17 down through verse 30, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel and uh, say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers his sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his free will offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering, you shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep or from the goats. So it had to be a male. It had to be without blemish. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. You couldn't give deformed or those that had defects. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There can be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or lamb that has any limb too long or too short, 
you may not offer as a free will offering, but for a vow it shall be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor shall you make any offering of them in your land. Nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. And the Lord said to Moses, or spoke to Moses, saying, When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter it shall be accepted as an offering by fire to the Lord. Whether it is a cow or a ewe, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. And when you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free will. On the same day it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. So there are several instructions here in regarding free will offerings, peace offerings to the Lord, certain things that could be offered, like certain defects in an animal could be offered for a peace offering, but not for a free will offering. All of these instructions were given, <clears throat> but in all of them we notice that it had to be something that was not blemished, that it was without uh, defect if it was going to be accepted as a free will offering to the Lord. Then we go on down into the 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus, where he talks about the first fruits. <coughs> Excuse me, they're in verses uh, 9 through 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So notice, it was to be the first fruits that they were to uh, offer to the Lord. Uh, he shall wave the sheep before the Lord uh, to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male of the lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord, for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And again, we see some specific instruction given to Israel in regarding to the grain offerings and the fact that they were not to eat of the harvest and the fruit until they had first made their offering <coughs> and waved the sheaf before God. They had to bring their first fruit. So God always wanted the first and the best that we have to offer. And you know, someone's best may not be as <coughs> as good as someone else's best. I think of the the poor widow that Jesus pointed out to his apostles that day in the temple, in the treasury, and a lot of rich people were giving great sums of money, and this woman only threw in just a couple of pence, and uh, the Lord said she had given more than them all because out of her poverty she gave her whole living so what we have may be different than what someone else has but whatever we have god wants us to give him the first and the best that we have so we know that this bin of flour and the jar of oil did not run out. We're told that they ate for many days. All of the household, however many of them there were, we know there was at least the widow, her son, and Elijah, but probably some other servants in that home that ate for many days, <coughs> according to Scripture, from this flour and oil because it did not run out. You know, God always provides. I think of the miracle of the loaves and the fishes in the New Testament, the little lad that had a few 
fish and a, a few loaves of bread. And, and the Lord took that and blessed it and fed a multitude of people, 5,000 men plus women and children. And then at the end of the meal, they took up the fragments and gathered 12 baskets full, more than what they had started with, no doubt. And so we can rest assured, Elijah had said to the woman, you don't be afraid, you fear not, and you go and you do, you know, what the Lord has, or what, what the Lord wants you to do, and bring me first, you know, he said, bring me first some bread, and then you and your son can eat. And so the widow obeyed, she did that, and the flour and the oil did not run out for many days. Well, this is a great miracle, and a wonderful thing that has happened to the widow and Elijah, and a great demonstration of their faith in God. But then not many days after that, this widow's son becomes ill and so sick that there was no breath left in him. Now, as we read all of the passage, and I know different ones have commented on this, maybe he had just passed out, he wasn't dead. The fact is that Three times Elijah stretched out over him and prayed for the Lord to re revive him by sending his soul back to him. So his soul had departed from him and it was Elijah asked for it to be returned. So we learn from this, of course, that even after great demonstrations of faith, we're not exempt from some of the problems of life. God never has promised us that we'll never have problems or we'll never have heartache or sorrow or that sickness will never come into our house. I know there are some that teach that. Wealth and health, that if you, uh, usually what they say, if you send them an offering, then, you know, they're going to pray for you or they're going to send you a prayer cloth and, and you know, you're going to be blessed right here, right now. You're going to be given, you know, more money and all that, but... Uh, the Lord has promised that he will provide for us. You know, that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount recorded in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And the things were, you know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? You know, how are we going to be clothed? All these things, you know, God will provide for you. So we'll have our necessities. We might not have everything we want, but God has promised us our necessities. But we are not promised that we will be, you know, disease-free, that we'll never have a child that'll be sick, or that we'll never lose a child to cancer or some other uh, disease that afflicts us here upon this earth in life under the sun. And so it's true of this widow. She was not exempt, even though she had demonstrated great faith. Her son became ill, and ill, it seems, to the point of death. And of course, Elijah performs another great miracle in bringing her back from the dead. We are reminded of what the Lord said over in the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter, where he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and, learn, and take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And of course, we know a yoke does not take the burden away. A yoke just helps us to bear the burden. It makes it easier to carry. And so that's what the Lord has promised, that we'll trust him, that he will give us a yoke that will make the burdens of life bearable. And that is his promise to us. We won't be exempt from problems. We will have a yoke to bear the burden of our problems. You know, this widow's reaction to all of this was, you know, why have you come to me, O man of God? Have you just come to remind me that I'm a sinner and remind me of all of my sins? And, you know, it's pretty common for us to think whenever something bad happens to us that, you know, we must have done something. What have we done that this came and happened to us? 
that we find good things happening to bad people, bad things happening to good people all the time in life under the sun. And that's what the wise man discusses in the book of Ecclesiastes in, in life under the sun. Things seem inequitable. Things are not fair, it doesn't seem. But, you know, we never perhaps will figure all of that out, but we just have to trust in God's providence and his care for us. And so this Riddle's reaction is, is pretty common, I think, to think, this, you know, what have I done that my son has become sick and ill? And of course, Elijah takes the son up into the upper chamber, lays him on his own bed, stretches out over him three times, calling upon the Lord to return this boy's soul to his body. And, and he comes and is revived. And so Elijah takes the son back down to the widow alive again and restored. And what rejoicing there must have been when the child was uh, brought back to life. You know, in this process, God, uh, Elijah even questioned God's purpose a little bit here. You know, you know, why have you done this, God, to this widow? Have, have you sent this tragedy into the life of this widow? And I suppose we all have these questions at times. As I said, we can't fully understand. But just like Elijah and the widow, we just have to trust God. We have to put our faith in in him and uh, of course his purpose is always to test us perhaps and to strengthen us and so he tested the widow he tested elijah but uh, he also was strengthening them through their trials and so we find that this is the case oftentimes we are strengthened through our trials you know, I, we are reminded of the case when we think about the widow and her wondering if she had done some great sin that caused her son to be sick, of the passage over in John 9, where a man was born blind and the disciples asked the Lord, who sinned, this man or, you know, his mom and dad that he was born blind? And Jesus answered and said, neither this man nor his parents, but that the, you know, that the glory of God may be manifested in him. And so in our struggles and as we undergo trials in life, when we bear them patiently with faith in God and with the Lord's help, then uh, we too become individuals who can honor and bring glory uh, to God. And so both Elijah and the widow are tested and strengthened in this way as many of us are in our lives. You know, all of the promises of God have been confirmed by miracle. We read over in the book of Hebrews, the second chapter and the first four verses, you know, take heed that we are to uh, take heed to the things that we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by those that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and various miracles, according to his own will. And I think it's so important that we remember it is according to God's timing and his purpose and plan for our lives, just as it was in the life of this widow and in the life of Elijah. These things happened. They were trusting in God for an answer to things. And in this case, the widow, you know, they, they got the answer of the continued flour and oil so that they could eat. And then the widow also got the joyous news that her son was alive again. And uh, it may not always be that way for us. Sometimes the child may die, as was the case of King David, remember? And you remember David's response was, you know, he will not return to me, but I can go to him. And so that maybe is, should be our response 
I know our response must be trust in God and knowing that all of the words of inspiration that we have in God's word have been confirmed by miracle. God was working with them according to his will to uh, make these things known to us. And so this uh, episode in the life of Elijah and the widow are a great uh, inspiration to us even today to trust in God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Continue to give God the first and the best that you have of your service, of your material goods, whatever it is, whatever little you may have, God can take it and he can stretch it and make it so that it is sufficient for our needs. And of course, we have the wonderful hope. And I think it is seen in this story as well because this son came back to life. And we know that the Son of God, when he came to this earth and was crucified, he was put in the grave, but the grave could not hold him. On the third day, he came forth from the grave. And because of his resurrection, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, we also have hope of our own resurrection. And so a great story from the life of Elijah about our putting our faith and our confidence in God and entrusting all of our life to him, all that he has blessed us with, giving him our first and our best. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are so thankful to you for your love for us and the wonderful provision that you have made for us because you have blessed us so often far beyond uh, what our needs are even. And so, Father, we thank you for all the ways in which you bless our lives, both materially but especially spiritually. And we're thankful, Father, for the word that you have given us that has been confirmed by miracle to us. And the fact that we can put our confidence in your word and we can know that you care for us and that you want us to come to you when we are burdened in life because you have a yoke for us that will help us to bear those burdens. And so we thank you for that promise, Lord, and for this assurance that you care for us and that you're with us no matter what our circumstances may be. And so wherever we may find ourselves, help us, Father, to always look to you and to give you the best that we have and the first that we have of whatever you've blessed us with. And we know if we'll do that, that you'll be pleased with us and that you will make things sufficient for us. Above all, we thank you for Jesus and for the wonderful hope that is ours in Christ of the resurrection from the dead and for the hope of eternal life and that eternal home that you have prepared for those that love you and love your appearing. And even so, may you come quickly, Lord Jesus, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're uh, thankful that you tuned in again and Pray that you'll continue to be with us as we look at some episodes in the life of Elijah. There's a lot of good lessons for us in the life of this prophet. Until we meet you again, we pray that God will bless and keep you. I have a longing, have a longing inside in this heart of mine. In this heart of mine. I want to be, yes, to be nearer to thee. Still nearer to I would be holy, I would be holy, O oh Lord, for I would be thine, yes, I would be thine. Draw me, I pray, yes, day after day, nearer to thee, 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 nearer to thee. Oh, blessed Lord, blessed Lord, this is my plea, this is my plea. 
I long to stand. Yes, Lord, I'm longing to stand in, in heaven's fair land. land. In heaven's fair land. Where I will be. Lord, where I will be. Nearer to thee. Nearer to thee. If I am faithful. Lord, if I'm faithful and true. Thy face I'll behold. Thy face I'll behold. Some happy day, yes, some day on heaven's shore, on heaven's right shore, and I shall walk, and I shall walk with the Lord on streets made of gold, on streets made of gold. They will all yes, lead, they will all lead nearer to thee, 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 nearer to thee. Blessed Lord, blessed Lord, this is my plea, this is my plea. I long to stand, yes, Lord, I'm longing to stand in, in heaven's fair land, in heaven's fair land, where I will Lord, be, where I will be, nearer to thee.